Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Science Studio program. My name is Keith Panel, and in the studio today is my good friend Russell Chianelli. And we've got a special guest who originally came from Brazil, went to Germany to study, and landed up in Texas, the great country of Texas. His name is Carlos Bertulani, and he's from Texas A&M University in Commerce. Carlos, welcome to Science Studio. Oh, thank you very much. Now, before we get into your area, which I know is sort of physics and fundamental physics at that, um, the listeners like to know a little bit about Carlos. How did you become what you are today? Well, why a scientist? Why not a, an artist or a beach bum? I always, uh, when I was a kid, I always was fascinated with many things. I remember still buying uh, Time magazine, and there was one issue which was about the space race. It was in the 60s, and I was in Brazil where Time magazine doesn't come as often as here, and I asked for that special issue. And I think, in a way, I had to gather some uh, people to buy Time magazine and uh, some colleagues to give the name and addresses of some colleagues who would be interested in buying Time magazine in, in order to get that special issue. So what I did is that I sent a lot of my colleagues' uh, names and address who were importunated later by Time magazine, sending them letters. Oh, I heard that you want to get Time magazine. But with that, like five to ten people, I don't remember the number anymore, I got that wonderful thing which was very well printed with the men and uh, uh, the flights uh, of people trying to get to space and to the moon, the, the, the Russian part and the American part. And since when I was a child, I was uh, interested. Now, how I got into science uh, well, when I was a child, I didn't have m many resources at home. We were relatively poor. Um, I tried to do all those science projects in school with what I had, wires and uh, batteries and things like that. But I couldn't make anything really, really good because I didn't have the resources. So I was looking in the books how to build engines and things like that. But when I went to high school, there was this teacher who was wonderful. He was, uh, for me, up to that point, the best teacher. And I came to him, and I started developing this interest for physics because he was a physics teacher in high school. And I asked him about physics, uh, and he looked at me and said, probably you are interested in doing research in physics, right? And I said, yes. And he said, forget it. <laughs> in Brazil, there is no resources to do there is no place where you can do research in physics. And I was so disappointed because he was my hero in terms of uh, teacher. And uh, he was giving me um, a very bad scenario what was research, that in Brazil we didn't have in universities any uh, physics researcher, which is not true. And so, so he just didn't know of the opportunities. No, I think he was probably a person who was disappointed with his own career and maybe he didn't make it to that uh, small what he would think was an elite of people who were doing research at university. What was his area of research? He wa This was high school. He was not doing research. He was teaching. I, I, if he ever did, I do not know. But this was interesting because I was going to apply uh, to enter the university in physics and then after his advice, I decided to go to astronomy. And so my first choice was astronomy, and the second was physics. And after I entered university, right in the first week, I decided to switch back to physics. <laughs> that's what how was, it started. Was that attraction to physics, or was it you didn't like what you saw in astronomy? Yeah, it was probably more associated with the environment uh, where I would have to go to study astronomy and physics, and probably the physics. I think the university offered a better building and, okay. and faculty, and, and I decided to stick to physics. But the so, interest was in stars and planets. Yeah, I interesting. I was always fascinated, as everybody else, with stars and planets. I, the reason I bring that up is I, I noticed that as you're, you're here, there's a report in one of the astronomy books that Venus and Mars, I think, are in tangles. Uh, on one day, when you get up early in the morning, you can see this very strange phenomenon. Are you aware of that? 
Well, entanglement is a word used to mean a, cer a certain correlation. There are some friends of mine who think everything is entangled in principle. So this word is misused in many aspects. In quantum mechanics, we have a special meaning for entanglement in the sense that... Quantum entanglement, yeah. Yeah, quantum entanglement. So you, you were an undergraduate studying physics. Now, in, in Brazil in those days, did undergraduate students get the opportunity to join one of the research groups? Right. And if you did, what did you do? Well, I had this colleague. He was a, a really uh, a little guy, and he still is a little guy. He was an adult at that time and still. Um, and he was bright, and we used to study together. And he said, you know that there is a chance to do science at, already at this stage, first year, bachelor degree. I said, really? How? Oh, there is uh, something which is even uh, funded. You can get money. It's called uh, scientific initiation, uh, which is uh, something that uh, was introduced by the government in public universities to foment young people to go to science. It's like an REU program. Right, good. And uh, so we went to the director uh, of this, uh, the chair of the department, and he said, okay, uh, now you work with this person and you work with this other person. And he was working with a person who was fantastic because he was straight going to hair research, doing measurements of things in adsorption in surfaces that she would use in a paper, and he would be co-author uh, the very first year. And, um, and I was sent to paint these uh, gallons of nitrogen or other things because they were rusting. <laughs> and uh, so I was so upset. And then I was lucky that there was this French guy doing some new experiments wh which used glass as... Uh, as uh, gases were passing through these tubes and very beautiful thing. And I still remember there was a, a meter with mercury, which is a very dangerous <laughs> thing. And he said to me, turn it, uh, but not very hard. He didn't finish, <laughs> and it was pressing hard, and this thing broke. Yeah. And this thing is spread <laughs> on the floor. So that lab was closed for many, many weeks until people could clean these little drops of mercury, the metal, yeah. which is very dangerous for health. Well, the vapor is dangerous. The vapor. You can swallow the actual metal, and it will pass straight through you with no harm. Is it so? Yes. But yeah, anyway, well, let, let's carry on. What, and, then I decided, and then I decided to do theory. Okay. <laughs> because I was bad with the experiment. First yeah, painting painting gallons and second breaking <laughs> instruments of people, very expensive stuff. I could not do it. Okay. But now you, you wanted to carry on your studies. You went, I believe, to, to Germany, to Bonn, the yeah. then capital of Germany. Yeah. What did you do there? I was in a place close to Bonn, uh, a big lab called Julisch, Kernforschungsanlagen Julisch. It's still there. 5,000 people work in an area which is surrounded by fences because they have a reactor and, and oh. other uh, expensive stuff there. And uh, my official um, PhD, the enrollment was in Bonn University, but I was working in this lab, which is about 50 kilometers, 30 miles from uh, Bonn. I'm from Cologne. And, and living out there, too. And I was living there, right. too, 20,000 people, pretty much similar to Commerce, Texas. <laughs> and it was a nice experience. Four years, no, three, three years, three and a half years I spent okay. there. And what, what was your basic research there? I was doing relativistic heavy ion collisions, which uh, heavy ions are nuclei which they strip of electrons and they are heavy nuclei, something like calcium, iron, and other nuclei, lead, and they accelerate because they are charged. So you put between a certain uh, voltage difference and they get accelerated. And at that time, there were uh, labs around the world. Here, Rick in uh, Brookhaven and in, in uh, Europe, CERN, which were accelerating these nuclei at very high velocities. 
and smashing them against each other, either targets or colliders, when they circulate and collide in, in, within the accelerator. And so the idea there is when these nuclei collide, you see what is given off from the collision. Mm-hmm. New species, new... Yeah, new particles. Were you particles. involved in one dramatic discovery that you saw something that nobody had seen? Well, uh, what happened is that uh, there are the central collisions uh, between nuclei in which the nucleons, which compose the nuclei, they expose their inner contents, which are quarks and gluons. And people are expecting to form this material. And still today, people are still debating if they have uh, identified this for sure, that there is a very short time in which you form this plasma of quarks and gluons from these broken eggs, which are the nucleons. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this might exist elsewhere in the universe, like in the center of neutron stars, uh, in the core of neutron stars. Uh, We don't really know. Um, but my research was something very unusual. We were looking for collisions in which the nuclei did not collide at all. They were passing by each other far away, uh-huh. and the only two things that would collide were, were their uh, electric and magnetic fields. And this electric and magnetic fields would be so contracted. There is an effect called Lorentz contraction, which contracts this field and makes them look like a pancake. Yeah. And they are so intense that when they pass through each other, they produce particles too, and many effects that, um, that uh, now are very popular. Uh, my thesis we publish in a, a highly reputable journal, a Physics Reports, and is highly cited. And I remember I was discouraged by many of the big professors in Germany saying that, why are you doing that? Everybody is looking for central collisions, and you are looking for these peripheral collisions where nothing happens, or nothing so interesting happens. But now at CERN and at RIC, the laboratory in Brookhaven, people are interested in these things now after 30 years. And I'm happy that my thesis was like the the one, the starting point. So you, you know? get lots of citations in your early one of, work. One of the very interesting things is that scientists are very proud of publishing, right? Publications are like their babies, <laughs> carry their names forever. They can take everything from you. They can take your <laughs> wife, your <laughs> money, your, but you publish something, it will always be there, like, right. so, like your baby. And there were these people who were competing to publish papers. And I was doing this thing which nobody was really so much interested. But in the end of my thesis, we published in peer-reviewed papers 15 papers in three years. Oh. 15, like five All papers per year. All on these near collisions. All on these near <laughs> collisions. And probably they were being published because nobody cared. You know, well, let's see, let him publish that. Who is well, going to read no that? there was no one there to yeah, referee. Who is going to read that, right? <laughs> right. So uh, while the other, my friends, the other colleagues in PhD, they were working very hard. And they were not publishing that much. You're listening to Science Studio. My name is Keith Pannell, here with Russ Kinelli, and our guest today is Carlos Bertulani. He's from Texas A&M University in Commerce, and we'll be back in one moment.
Welcome back to Science Studio. Keith Panel, Ross Chianelli, and Carlos Bertulani from Texas A&M University in Commerce, <clears throat> Texas. Well, that was a very interesting concept there. Near collisions, nobody was interested in them. Therefore, nobody could review them very well. But they were but you flat got 15 pancakes. 15 papers. <laughs> in three years. I love it. Yes. But you got flat pancakes when they passed by. Yes. So, so what did that mean? Uh, there is something called Lorentz contraction. And yeah. when, uh, when uh, particles, uh, they travel at very high speeds, uh, everything gets contracted in, uh, for, for the laboratory system. For people who are staying in the laboratory system, you see this, uh, this uh, um, matter distribution, uh, uh, pancake-like, contracted along the direction of motion. And not only for the matter, but also for the electric fields. You think that the electric fields are spherically symmetric. You, you think about the hairs going out yeah. symmetrically from a nucleus, a charged particle. When they are moving at high speeds, it looks like everything is contracted like a pancake. Yeah. So that was your PhD work. Mm -hmm. And because of the absence of people working in the area, 15 papers <laughs> in three years, uh, this is, there's a moral there for the listener. You know, choose some little area of science that no one knows much about. Do uh -huh. the good writing. Do the good experiments. And it's there, as you say, your baby for all time. So now you, you came back to, to Brazil after this, or what, how did your own individual career progress? Yeah, by that time I was very much used to Germany, to the life in Germany. So when, when I went back to Brazil, I was not really happy because uh, I learned a lot about um, the German organization, and you can imagine in Brazil <laughs> is not exactly, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and, and I was already a professor uh, assistant professor in Rio de Janeiro when I went out for my PhD in Germany. I got my position at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Janeiro in uh, 1980. Uh, 1979, I was 23 years old at that time. Uh, so I married, I had money, and in Brazil, when you get a position, it's forever. Right. Right. So now you married much, somebody from Brazil, not somebody from Germany. My wife. No, not. Oh, no, no, no. But this was before I went to Germany. Ah, okay. So when I went to Germany for my PhD, I already had taught at the university for a few years. Ah, I see. And I did my master's degree, and then I went to Germany. So when I was a PhD student in Germany, in Jülich, uh, my badge to enter the lab was written below professor. And the other colleagues, PhD students, they were very upset with me <laughs> because I was treated like God when I was going through the gate. The guy would... would uh, right. That's the German efficiency. Hey, Dr. Professor. Yes. The and I was just a, just a student. <laughs> well, in Brazil, it doesn't happen like this anymore that you are high so young and without a PhD at the university. At that time, Brazilians are very worried that you are going to hire your mother, your parents. So they put a lot of obstacles for you to get a position. And at that time, they put so many obstacles that the good people stayed out and I was hired. Let me ask you how many, you're very fluent in English, but you're also fluent in German. In German, of course, yeah, Portuguese. Sicherlich. Und auch in Portuguese, eu posso falar bem Portuguese. E hablo bien Espanhol también. E un po de Italiano. Oh, man, that's five yeah. languages. We be in. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's talk about what you're doing now, your interest. Yeah. And in particular, I'd like to talk about your interest in, in lithium because, lithium. you know, how does lithium form? I think, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, this big bang and a certain progress from that T is equal to zero mm -hmm. into the future. Just, mm -hmm. just talk a little of this. Yeah, well, uh, the big bang starts with matter. Uh, there is a singularity. And uh, there is uh, a theory that is successful to explain many stages before protons and nuclei, uh, nucleons, uh, neutrons, uh, nucleons in general form. And this happens about uh, three minutes after the Big Bang. And um, only like after 20 minutes after the Big Bang, the element starts to form. Like you first form deuterium, which is just a neutron plus a proton is a heavy hydrogen, and then after that you form helium-3, helium-4, 
and you go up to lithium and beryllium, but then you stop because the temperatures and densities are not that high to form higher elements because heavier elements because the nuclei have charge and they repel each other very highly before they can come close together and react to form heavier elements. I mean, and if you think about it, the density of these heavier, that is one, two, three uh, atoms, to coalesce, they've got to find each other. Mm. And it's, it's a very dilute environment, if I can put it that way. Right, right. Yeah, and that's the reason why we didn't form elements heavier than beryllium. And beryllium itself, when it's formed, it captures an electron, and in about two months, it becomes lithium. So all beryllium formed in the Big Bang becomes lithium. And then very small traces, ridiculously small, of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen are formed. But then the universe enters in this dark age after these elements are formed. And only when the stars were formed later, uh, the, the gravitational force would collapse huge masses of proton gas and, and, and helium to all together. And when they come very close together, it starts to heat up, and then this reaction starts occurring and forming heavier elements, for example, carbon, oxygen, and so on. For, for the listener, you say it just like it's an obvious feature of history. Well, three minutes after the Big Bang, da-da-da-da, and then 20 minutes after the Big Bang. T tell the audience, how on earth do you get that sort of information? It's because we use the physics that we know now, and we apply to that um, evolution of the universe. And the physics involved are is cosmology, gravitational uh, theory, uh, both Newtonian or, or Einsteinian gravitational theory. Uh, these, these are called um, cosmological models, and a very popular one is the Friedman model. And it's based on the physics that we know now, and it works pretty well. Uh, we use the statistics, we use all the tools that we know nowadays of uh, physics, and it works pretty well. So, yes, I mean, but there, there's a mistake in the Big Bang theory that I remember very well, and that is that if there's a Big Bang and they're going out and the particles get further and further away, the universe should slow down and come back and contract and have another Big Bang. But what the observation is, is that uh, as it gets further out, it speeds up. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a big attack on the Big mm -hmm. Bang Theory because that meant that there's all this dark energy and matter out there. Right. So th uh, recently there was a finding in which, contrary to what is, uh, was expected, the universe is in fact accelerating outwards. Uh, and this is what we call uh, dark energy. And it composes most of the energy which you assume is related to mass, of course, of the universe. This was somehow an accident that uh, when Einstein wrote down his equations, there was this term that he introduced in order to make the universe static because he didn't like the idea that the universe was dynamical. It had to be static. And he put a term there called the cosmological term. And nowadays, people think that it might be this term. It might be this term which uh, is responsible for this dark energy. But it might also be something else. There are other theories out there. You stated that using modern physics and, and then sort of modeling and going backwards, that therefore this is where the three minutes, the 20 minutes sort of time periods come. Why would modern physics, as we have got it now, necessarily work in that primordial environment? It is a very good question. We don't really know. We only, uh, how, how it happens with, uh, with science is that, in particular with the physics, is that you have a theory. If the theory uh, is good, it predicts something. And if it predicts something and you measure or you observe and it works, then you start believing that that thing is correct. So the Big Bang uh, theory and the Big Bang nucleocentric theory in particular, it predicts a lot of things which are observed with uh, following that prediction. That's why we think the theory is right. That's why we cannot go back and, and verify it. We no can experiment. only yeah, no experiment. Well, we, we are, are like, watching some Big Bangs out there at a very long distance. No. Yes, uh, there are. Uh, when you look at back in stars uh, and you look for the shift in their wavelengths of the light emitted, 
we get lots of clues that the theory is right. So the so-called red shift of distant stars is, uh, is um, something that we predict with the theories that we know about how light behaves, that in fact those stars are expand, uh, uh, spanning outwards in the universe. So there are so many things that we use the regular physics that we know, and it, it work. works, yep. and it predicts something. But there that, is that's one how that, we uh, we are we, we answer to your question. That's how we believe that those twenty minutes we know what was going on yeah. there. But, uh, you know, it's so interesting how uh, when you talk about the universe and physics, there's so much that we don't know. Yeah. And one of them right now is a standard model. Right. Which uh, is incomplete and requiring the uh, presence of wimps. Please say a little bit to the audience about the standard model. Yes. The standard model has been highly successful. It has predicted so many particles that we have detected and given so many Nobel Prizes to people. But the standard model is for all the particles in the universe. Yes, and the recent discovery of the Higgs was one of the huge success of the standard model. Now, there are some small things, and we are always looking for what doesn't match in this puzzle. Scientists are always looking, oh, but there is a small thing which doesn't fit, which requires... Uh, maybe other theories, and there are many people who are working in string theories or or a new realm of particles like supersymmetric particles, and and uh, unfortunately so far we have no uh, proof that those particles exist. But one of those particles that you're talking about is a WIMP, W-I-M-P. Yeah, yeah, I know what's a WIMP. It's a weakly interacting massive particle, and the WIMP is um, just a name. Uh, that we give to dark matter particles that we don't know anything about them except that they interact gravitationally. And they might interact between themselves very weakly. That's why we give this name WIMP, which is a funny name, by the way. Well, it's self-evident what it means usually, yes. We, we've come to the end of, of our allotted 28 minutes. But just very quickly, this experiment and no, all this approach that you used as the graduate student with almost colliding particles it's it's you you've got a lot of recognition from that have you done anything since that's on that level and how does that make a scientist feel yes uh, in fact I, I i don't think i have not done anything at that level i think it was very good that i didn't know much at that time and i had nothing to lose <laughs> right. and now i have something to lose which is my the credibility of my work so i cannot be as creative as i was when i was 28 years old or so and, and i think that's a that's an excellent point to leave this discussion that there's some conservatism that comes into doing science you're very prone to make big risks or take big risks early in a career. Right. And as it develops, mm -hmm. that tendency may well go away. But we'll have to do a program on that because I know you, you've That's got old ideas like about that. that, actually. Anyway, we'd like to thank you very much, Carlos. Carlos I have to thank you. Carlos Bertulani from Texas A&M University in Commerce, Texas. Uh, Russi, it's nice to see you again. Yes, and, and thanks to Laura Terrazas, our producer. We'll see you again next week with another science studio. Bye-bye.